you crush all this garbage, it makes garbage juice, and that's called leachate. And it, it, leachate, that's just, and, and sometimes it's not terrific stuff. It's not stuff that you would want to drink. And Leo, you want to add anything else? Okay, now this, first this is the trans, San Francisco's transfer station. It takes in 3,000 tons of garbage, and you're looking only about, uh, there's not even one half of one day's garbage in there. We collect the garbage in this station right here, and then we ship it to Livermore, which is about 60 miles away. San Francisco has no landfill. If they refuse our garbage tomorrow, I don't know what we do with this garbage. This comes in every single day, I and mean, then three times as much as what you see there. We'd be in bad trouble. The demographics are such that if we achieve a 50% waste reduction by the year 2000, in the year 2000, we'll still be generating as much as we're generating today. So a 50% cut only keeps us where we are. There's no market for any plastic bags. And no matter what they tell you that we'll take it back at the store, they're dumping it in a dumpster at night and we're hauling that away. Because if there is a market, I'm going to show you 50 bales, of which are millions of plastic bags that I've collected, sorted, and bailed them, and I can't sell them to anybody. So where is the government? Why doesn't the government say stop tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock and quit making this stuff that you can't recycle? We need federal legislation banning this material. I wish I was president one day. I'd straighten all the environmental problems out for them in 24 hours. We can't just say that the economy of the country is the part that moves in front of our noses. The economy of the country is also how expensive it is to dig up those resources and how expensive it is to bury those resources at the end. That's all part of the economy. But we don't understand this and we don't ask the right questions because we're caught in the hypnotism. Nobody wants to look like a failure, so we all wear the right clothes and drive the right cars. Many of us, some of us don't, obviously. And we feel we need to do this because we want people to think of us in a certain kind of way. Sonoma County Landfill. This is the recycling center at the side of it, which we are about to call Recycle Town, because we are going to be building a whole recycling center out of building materials. So there will be the buildings around the back. Yeah. You know, the Recycle Town General Store and the schoolhouse and the library and all that stuff. And then right here, these totem poles will encircle the sculpture garden. And we'll have, you know, prominent artists displaying their scraptures. <laughs> A new terminology for junk art. So this is a rake-tailed booby, and Bill and I are also boobies. Yes. We're one of the six few or remaining boobies that are left. Because there's the mother booby, and there are four chick boobies coming back from the grave. I might say these have been very endangered. Pfui. Dusty not here. To admit <laughs> who the father booby was, though. <laughs> That's just the mother. We don't we don't know who the father was. So they're coming back from the brink of extinction, and we're really pleased to have been helpful. <laughs> These goggles, you'd never realize it, but they're recycled. Uh, they fit so well and everything, you probably thought they were right from the store, but they are recycled cat food cans. This is Bob. Um, he's a... Uh, well, actually, he's sort of a self-portrait, even though he's a guy and I'm not. But I, I, so I don't know why he's a guy, even though he's a self-portrait. But um, I, I live up in uh, Mendocino County, and I was down by the river one day. And I, this inner tube was lying there, along with this boot. And I just knew that this I needed these feet, and I just picked them up and took them home, and there they were. So that's why he only has one shoe, because I only found one boot. That's his heart. Well, it's a little door, you know, and you can open it. And this, it's just like fur with um, foxtails in it. Eventually what I'm going to do with this thing, I think, is I'm going to try to sneak a table onto the top of it so that I can take Judy from the dumps, or Pavitra, and serve them tea up on top, right? So it'll be like a tower for having a cup of tea. 
Uh, it doesn't have any theme at this point, you know. It's like just junk. They have a whole committee trying to figure out what to do with these lenses, right? Because it's a, it's not, it's not a polyester. It's a, it's a resin of some sort of resin. So it can't, it's, it can't be recycled, right? So they're stuck with tens of thousands of these things, and they're trying to figure out what to do with them. Yeah, I got them from Sears, uh, TV, TV repair shops, and the recycling center averaged about two a day. They came in. And uh, actually, what I learned from doing this was that in California, uh, a TV repairman cannot legally put a used part in your TV set if he can buy a new one. So consequently, people junk their TV sets instead of replacing the, you know, an expensive part in it. One major motiv motivating factor was the uh, uh, the access of free materials. So we, you know, TVs are junk TVs are free and they're big. So that's what we ended up with. And, if, and of course, it's a it's a a brilliant statement on the uh, on the culture, American culture. Of course, TV sets, the icon, you know. I came out to look for junk. Uh, that being the ground rule, you know, you make it out of junk, presumably from here. First thing I found was the the street light at the top. Uh, and given that I work a lot with the figure, that street light was automatically a head. The head dictated the rest. <laughs> I've dealt with trash for over 20 years. And start, starting with the litter on my sidewalk, I very quickly, when you deal with what's on the sidewalk, you discover that there are two issues. One is the sociology of the population, and the other is the ecology of a society that's producing so much to be thrown away that never needed to exist, and that is like throwing the earth away a little bit at a time every day. And if you really think about it, it's the only earth we've got that's an untenable situation. You have to do something about it. Uh, I think very often that the problem we have is that we we talk about the wrong questions, like um, there's all this discussion in this area of cutting trees to have jobs or of giving priority to the owl. Well, this is a false question. Either or is always a false question. The question, the, the reality is that the owls and the loggers are on, both, on the same side of existence. If one goes, the other will go. My name is Dave Hall. I'm the uh, resource specialist for the city of Arcata. And we're standing here at the Arcata Marsh and Wildlife Sanctuary, which is a part of uh, the city of Arcata's integrated wetland wastewater treatment. Uh, wetland restoration and wastewater aquaculture project. What all that means is that for the last six years we've been using constructed wetlands to treat our wastewater and then the set of wetlands that were that are behind me uh, to actually use those as sort of a disposal area for the treated wastewater. All the water that's behind me is uh, is treated wastewater. Okay, this is where the raw sewage enters Arcata's wastewater treatment plant. These Archimedes screw pumps uh, lift the water up where it begins its treatment process. After the wastewater spends about three hours going through the primary treatment plant, uh, it heads on out toward our oxidation ponds out behind me back here. There's 44 acres of oxidation ponds that the water filters through before it, it goes through uh, our three treatment marshes. It works its way back to the building that's right behind me with the blue edge on it. That's our chlorine contact chamber and uh, that's where the water is chlorinated both before it goes over to the Martian Wildlife Sanctuary and before it, as it comes back before it's discharged to the bay. Piggy, 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 piggy! Piggy! 
My name is Joe Garbarino and I'm president of these companies that you see here, the garbage company, the recycling company, and the resource recovery company. And resource recovery is an indoor dump. There's three football fields on the one roof and we're currently recycling. 70% was dumped into that facility that was normally going into a dump. And now 70% of that is being reused for something else. What we've got here, you know, is a, is a new program. And the new program is a yard waste a program where we pick up yard waste from your home every other week and we give you a, a container to do this. It's a special container. It's got air holes so the, the material breathes all the time and doesn't smell when you pick it up every other week. So after we pick it up, we dump five tons a day here now. Starting in August, we'll put more bins out. We'll have 15 tons a day. And because there's so much green in it that when you grind it up, it's too much moisture to burn this material as fuel. So we let the goats eat all the green, the moisture out of it. Then as they finish and we feed them, then we grind it up and make it into a fuel. And each ton of yard waste is the equivalent of 2.6 barrels of oil. We will now gather it because the animals have eaten all the green out of it, bring it into the building, grind it up into small particles the size of a silver dollar, and then we'll ship it to a factory that uses it in lieu of burning oil. And if we did this nationwide, we wouldn't need to uh, dig any more holes in the ground or in the ocean to dig for more oil. We're burying our natural resources right now and have been for a century. So that's what I'm doing here and it's working quite well. The pigs that you see are another program where we pick up a lot of food from uh, a food bank that feeds the poor and has excess or wasted food. We also pick up supermarkets and, uh, and uh, factories that make uh, bread and pizza and we use the material that can't be fed to the people and we feed that to the animals and we feed them eight tons a day. And when you look at uh, uh, depositing this um, into a dump somewhere, it's 50 to $55 a ton. So we not only save that, but we recycle that food, recycle the pigs, and we can, we can feed a generation of people. Uh, we get cases and cases of food that's still in the bag. Uh, the milk is still in the carton. It's outdated. Uh, humans can't eat it, but animals can. A pig can digest damn near anything. It's a great digester. And after we wean the pigs from their mamas, which we've had about 50 or 60 born here in the last two weeks, then uh, we put them in here where the, uh, uh, where the kindergarten piggies are, where they're all the same size, can compete for their food. Then we let them out into the larger yard. And every seven months, a little piggy goes to market size from nothing to 210 pounds. And then uh, we'll either keep some for more breeding or uh, uh, bring those and donate them or bring them to market, stuff like that. But it's a fantastic eating machine. It'll eat almost anything. And the goat is the same way when it comes to yard waste. So it's, uh, it's an easy project, but one that's consuming a lot of waste rather than paying a ridiculous price to bury it somewhere. Was this your idea? Yeah, yeah, I started out when I was planning this new building, I would see 200 loaves of bread here every day and I was wondering where they came from. And when I saw those 200 loaves of bread, why, uh, I immediately bought three pigs and I've gotten up to as high as 200 pigs. And uh, I just hated burying bread, it was like a mortal sin. So uh, again, it's a chain reaction. Animals eat a food product that we don't eat and it goes right on around and we recycle everything, even the poo that we have here is uh, used as a compost material. So we waste very little, if anything. NorCal Artists in Residence program is fairly new. It's only about two years old. I'm the sixth artist in residence. And um, basically, it's a model program for artists working with industry and working with the community. And they give you, give me a studio, one artist at a time, a studio for six months, um, a stipend. And um, my only requirement is to use as much discarded material as possible in my work. NorCal Sanitary Field Company is San Francisco's waste management company. It's no longer, there's no longer any landfill left in San Francisco. So this is a massive transfer station. All of San Francisco's garbage, waste, trash is brought to this one site near South San Francisco near Candlestick Park. And I'm making a 
permanent sided sculpture garden for NorCal where it would be drought sensitive and more of the materials would be from the waste stream that instead of using fancy rocks I would use um, discarded pieces of concrete. Central to the garden is a mountain which mirrors or echoes the shape of the San Bruno Mountains behind the site and it's one of the last beautiful open spaces left in the San Francisco um, city county area and coming out of the mountain is a is a metaphorical river of concrete and into that concrete is embedded graffiti like drawings made by some 90 high school students from Philip and Sally Burton High School here in San Francisco. Everybody take a nail. Okay. The thing to do is don't worry if it gets really crumbly and um, remember line drawings are best, okay? okay? Don't forget to put your name. And we can use someone right here. Oh, me. Okay. Okay, you come right here. So you draw here. You draw here. You got the space right here. And and do a, th do a thin line first so that you can get your drawing in and then you can go back and go over it several times. I mean, just to yeah, warn you guys. Yeah, I'll remember, you can go down and hit some Yeah, you don't know. Wait, wait. What's that? 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 <laughs> One little girl said to me, did this used to be garbage? And like, it was the best compliment that I ever got. You know, I just love the fact, because she got the point that it used to be garbage and now it wasn't garbage anymore because someone had put it to a different use. We are in the Sonoma County landfill. This is the recycling center at the side of it. So we're going to start off this little tour with the building materials right here. My name, by the way, is Pavitra Krimmel, and the name of the company I work for is Garbage Reincarnation. Right here, you see, we have, uh, it's kind of messy right now. One of the reasons it's messy is we don't have enough room. We have so much coming in. That's why we're going to get an expansion. But basically, we've got toilets, and we've got sinks over there, and bathtubs. And we save these because people throw them away in perfect shape all the time. I don't know why they do this, but they do it all the time. And in fact, they throw so many ceramic sinks and ceramic toilets away that we can't resell everything. And so right here you see the relationship between reuse and recycling. On the Right over here, there is a bin that contains the broken toilets, and we have to get in there and smash this stuff down and pull out all the stuff that's not ceramic. There's an incredible amount of windows that get thrown away, and there's no known recycling mode for these. The, the glass in windows, you cannot put through the regular recycling of glass bottles because it melts at a different temperature, particularly the safety glass. So we set up this thing here and people have discovered that you can use these windows in different kinds of applications. You can have greenhouses, for example, or you can build, there's a, there's a man I know who built a whole sauna out of discarded wood and uh, wood windows, and they're, they're really beautiful. Okay, here, here we have motorbikes in the front, and actually going toward the back is a conglomeration of automobile parts and anything that uh, doesn't really fit anywhere else. And uh, I call this the tinkerer's place. These are the people who look at things in a whole new way. And in fact, their whole life, the, the, the way they go through their life has to do with they think of what they need first and then they invent something that will fit their needs. They understand how things work. And so when they come to this junkyard, they get very excited and they start looking at things. And these are the people that kept me going all these years. So this is what we call the miscellaneous section. Miscellaneous being everything that doesn't have a category. And one of the, the first things that, that comes to my mind is, is looking at those baby seats over there. You know, when we have new babies in this country, these young couples who have their babies, they're often strapped for money, and yet the world that we live in insists that they buy brand new stuff for their baby, and for some reason the baby is going to be deprived if it doesn't have all this brand new stuff. 
So there's this sort of status system that is written into the whole process and is what in fact is causing all of this stuff to be thrown away. The other part of that status system, the reason it's been set up is because of a thing called the gross national product. And we hear a lot about these days because of the recession. The gross national product is how many things are being produced in this country. And if more things are being produced, we're doing well, and less, less things are pr being produced, we're not. Which means that the more things that are being produced, they have to go through our lives faster and faster and faster and faster because we can't hold on to them. Eventually we have, you know, our, our garages fill up, so we throw them away. And my question is, is that a correct indicator of, of value? Everybody says, oh, you can't mess with the gross national product. You can't mess with it. It's like it's, it's God. You know, we threw out God, and now we got the gross national product, you know. And it isn't God, and it's, it's, it starts with a, a sense of e economy that, that doesn't take most things into account. It doesn't take into account how much it costs to pull it out the ground. Okay, here we are in the bicycle section. Uh, what, are, what are the things that happens in, in the world of big freeways is it becomes dangerous to ride a bicycle. The second thing that happens in, manufacturer is, in manufacturing is that some people build things that look flashy that aren't very good and uh, sell them very cheaply and so people buy the cheaper one because they don't know the difference between a quality bicycle and a non-quality bicycle. So a lot of bicycles that get thrown away on account of all those reasons. But it's a very difficult economics for the repair people when people build things that are practically disposable and sell them very cheaply it's very difficult to buy something put a lot of money in the repair of it and try and get at least some part of your labor costs back and stay in business and that's one of the reasons that you don't see repair businesses around very much okay here we have the toxic waste shed <laughs> Um, these uh, right behind me are all the batteries batteries are actually very easy to recycle or at least it appears that way right now and uh, they are also some of the most toxic and deadly things in a landfill and we really need to get 100 percent of these lead acid batteries out of landfills it is lead that contaminates landfills and incinerators the worst and while on the subject of batteries you notice we do not have any household batteries here household batteries are almost impossible to recycle there's a whole lot of different kinds of them and I, I mean I basically have this feeling rightly or wrongly the people who create things that are totally unrecyclable and totally dangerous you know with mercury and lead and all that stuff in them they ought to be thrown in jail or something because it's a, it's like a crime and they're creating it but we the people who buy these things end up being the ones who have them when we want to throw them away so we get to be the criminals what we need to do once again is to make batteries that are rechargeable that we can use again and again and again otherwise we just we're going to set up all these these programs to collect all this hazardous material that are unbelievably expensive and then all the counties and all the cities are going where are we going to get the money from you know the state of california is not going to give us any more money they're already broke so where are we going to get the money from to do this what we need is to have the people who are giving us all this stuff to take a little bit more responsibility to let us know these things are a problem to themselves set up recycling programs or pay for them or they set up rechargeable batteries they need to do this we can only do so much here in the field when the stuff's already been created and is being thrown at us we need to all take responsibility for what we're doing here i think people want a decent decent place to live and air to breathe and water to drink but government and industry don't don't go with what we want, and that's got to change. I don't know how, but we don't have too much alternative. So if you can't make an item that can be recycled, you, the public, whoever you are making this stuff, you should be banned from making it in the first place. Don't look at us in the scavenger business. We can't do something uh, about an item that you made that we can't turn around and sell it to somebody. It's so simple, it's pathetic. What is the worth of a human being apart from what he owns and what he wears and what he looks like? Because really, look at all this stuff. If it has value for me, why should I throw it away? If it does the job it needs to do, why should I throw it away? I don't throw it away.